it mean to make the Lord our hope and confidence? What does that look like in real life? And so I looked at Jeremiah's life because there, he is an example of someone who truly made the Lord his hope and confidence. And I kind of came up with three things, three things that I pulled out. And it's not a step-by-step -step thing. It looks different for everyone. But the first thing was that he devoured God's word. He devoured God's word. It says, if you turn back in your, in your Bible just a couple pages to Jeremiah 15, verse 16. This is Jeremiah speaking. He says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord, God of heaven's armies. Man, when I'm in a trial, this is like food to me. The last two weeks have been two of the roughest weeks of my life. And this word has been like food to me. I am devouring it. It is where I find joy and my heart's delight. And Jeremiah would have had God's word. He had not all of it, because obviously he wrote some of it. But I, I did some research, and I thought, what would he have had access to? What would he have known? He would have had all of Moses' writings, Genesis, all the way to Deuteronomy. He would have had even Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah was 100 years before Jeremiah. He would have had the words of Hosea. He would have had all of the Psalms. And what, I think there's proof that he had the Psalms. Flip over to Psalm chapter 1. Psalms is like right in the middle of your Bible. This is why I think Jeremiah had Psalm chapter 1. He says in the first two verses there, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners and join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Number three, they are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. I think he knew it, didn't he? He had Psalm chapter 1. He devoured God's word. He read it all the time because his circumstances were crazy. You see, it doesn't say... Easy is the life for the one who makes the Lord their hope and confidence. I'm one of those people who's like a fill-in-the-blanker. That's why you have fill-in-the-blanks. And I, I took that sentence, blessed is the one who makes the Lord their hope and confidence. It doesn't say easy. It doesn't say rich. It doesn't say problem-free. Jeremiah's life was not problem-free. He was mocked. He was rejected by his own family. Do you know what that would have been like in his day? The blessing from your father was huge. Now, we want, we want our parents' approval now. We want them to bless us and know us. But in Jeremiah's day, I mean, if you remember when, when Jacob stole the birthright from Esau, for those of you who are familiar with that story, that was a big deal that he took the blessing. Jeremiah's father was a priest. He was the son of a priest who lived in a small town outside of Jerusalem. And when Jeremiah began hearing from God these messages, they were not popular because you know what Jeremiah was telling them? He was telling them to surrender to Babylon. Imagine today, just, just imagine, think back to the Twin Towers hitting. Imagine another country has attacked our country, and your son, who's young, probably around my son's age, around 15, says, God told me to speak his messages with power, that we're supposed to give in and just be exiled and go over to Babylon, and then God will save us. I'd be going, shh, you didn't tell anybody else that, did you? That's not popular. And we would question, is that really from God? Did he really say that? That is what God told Jeremiah, and it cost him his family. He was mocked. He was put in prison. He was left one time in a cistern, which is like a, a thing that collects rainwater, and there was mud and sludge in the bottom. He was left in there. Who does he remind you of? The parallels between Jesus and Jeremiah are like no other prophet. They, were both, they both wept over the city of Jerusalem, wanting them to repent and turn to the Lord. They both were taken to Egypt against their will. I mean, the list is long. They had a similar message. What did Jesus say? He did have a message of love, just as Jeremiah did, but he also said, turn from your sin and turn to God. So it wasn't easy for Jeremiah to make the Lord his hope and confidence, but he did it. And one of the ways that he was able to do that was when he was in prison or when he was mocked or when his, he was lonely for his family. He devoured this. He read it. He studied it. He probably memorized it. The Psalm 1 said, meditating on it day and night. 
And I just want to turn that question around and ask you, where are you at with God's word? Is it, is it the Bible that you're looking around for on Sunday morning so you can take it with you to church? Is it sitting over in the corner? I love the saying, the Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who's not. I know it's trite, but it's so true. There's a man in our church, he comes in every Sunday morning, and his Bible literally looks like it's going to fall apart. And you know what? He is a godly man because he knows God's word because he's in it all the time, reading it, studying it. I don't know what that looks like for you, what, how that can change in your life. Maybe you need to join a Bible study. Maybe you need to get an accountability partner. Maybe you just need to start a practice of every night before I go to bed, I'm going to try to read a psalm. Or every morning when I wake up, I'm going to try to get in. Or maybe, maybe you're, you're a student of God's word, but you're not memorizing it. You're not meditating on it. You're not going to that next level with God. I just want to challenge you to be the plant by the riverbank. I think we have to be tight with God's word. So Jeremiah devoured God's word. Second thing, which this is funny to me, I, I, I'm in the Beth Moore James study right now with the women in my study, and, and this week we watched the video, and she's talking about how James has so many great illustrations. It has the horses, and it has water, and it has sailboats, and she's so excited about them. And in my mind I thought, and this is what God gave me with Jeremiah. There's the plain white ones. <laughs> then there's the nude color, which, you know, you discover that if you're going to wear white pants or white shorts, you've got to have the nude color. <laughs> then there's, you know, frilly pink with rhinestones. They come in all different shapes and sizes. And then, you know, grandmas need underwear, too. So, you know, you've got to have those. And we know that there's one more parent here, but I, I am a very modest, private Texas woman, and I know that you know what's in here. So we're just going to leave those over here. And you laugh, but this is the illustration God gave to Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 13, just a few pages before, and let me tell you what's going on here. What's going on is God kept using physical illustrations to explain things to Jeremiah because we are hard-headed and we don't get it and we need tangible things to understand it. And so he said, Jeremiah, I want you to take a loincloth, a linen loincloth, which is, I mean, have no doubt about it. You can study any commentary. It's underwear. It's just, it's underwear. And he said, take the underwear and I want you to go to the Euphrates River and I want you to hide it in a rock and leave it there. And then he came home and then later God said to him, go get it out of the rock. And he pulls it out and it's all rotten because it's been sitting in a hole. And in verse 11, this is God just given the point of that illustration. He said, as a loincloth clings to a man's waist, so I created Judah and Israel to cling to me, says the Lord. They were to be my people, my pride, my glory, and an honor to my name. But they would not listen to me. Make that your own, ladies. He's saying, I created you to be close to me. I want you to be close to me like underwear. Let's think about underwear for a minute. Anybody like it loose? I mean, come on. No. It's got to be tight. It's got to be close. Someone else pointed out when we were studying Jeremiah that underwear is not just tight. It's personal. It's intimate. We don't show everybody our underwear. We're embarrassed if kids go rumbling through my underwear drawer. Is that just me? I can remember as a sixth grader going to a pool party and having to change out of your clothes and put on your swimsuit. And, I'd, you know, you have your shorts and your shirt and you tuck your underwear in the middle because you don't want it. And mine fell out on the floor. And I remember being so embarrassed to grab it, stuff it back in because it's private. It's personal. It's intimate. And that's how God wants to be with us. There's a third thing about underwear that God brought to my mind. It's daily, right? I mean, don't you, when you're folding the laundry and one of your kids' underwear piles a little low, you're like, hey, sister, every day, right? I mean, we know. It's every day, right? So, and, and how cool is it? And I won't make you turn. I believe Jeremiah got that whole daily thing because the book of Lamentations, which is the book right after Jeremiah, was written by Jeremiah. It's his lament over what was going on to, with his people. And he wrote this in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. 
He said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. I mean, these people, their land was destroyed and they were carried off into captivity. But he said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He might have been thinking of that loincloth. They are new every morning. Every morning. 